everything's better with coffee. Welcome to the Exploring Washington State podcast. Here's your host, Scott Cowan. Tawny and Laura, thanks for being here. I appreciate you guys making some time this afternoon to uh, talk about what you guys are doing at the Full Moon Market. So one of you, raise your hand. I don't care which one because we're doing this with three people, folks. So we're going to talk all over each other. This will be more of a train wreck than a normal Exploring Washington State podcast episode. It's going to be fun. Who wants to go first? Raise your hand so I can say your name. Oh, Laura, you've been nominated because well, Tony pointed at you. So, Laura, <laughs> give us give us some story on on Full Moon Market. The the story. Okay, well, I'm Laura Burkhart, and I'm an artist. And Tawny is also an artist and a ceramicist. Her company is called Henry, and I'm sure we'll get into that more. But we basically came together to form the Full Moon Market, which is a a marketplace. Sort of a it started as a maker's market. We pivoted in COVID. I'm sure we're going to talk about that. And it's basically a gathering of Northwest artisans, small businesses to come together and share and sell their goods. Okay. Tawny. That's the same thing. You have to talk now. Yeah. Um, I don't know how much I would add to that. Um, yeah. So Laura and I both have businesses that we work on. Our, we create our artwork t- separately um, from home, which has been really cool. Um, I've been working in my studio that we put together last year and Full Moon Market started. Oh gosh, Laura, I might need your help. Well, it was officially it? started the end of 2018 was our first thrown market. together market, which I feel like, Tani, you should talk about that right. first one. That was, it, that was in November. It was right before the holidays. And um, my husband used to run Stumptown, which used to be located on Capitol Hill. Um, and they had this basement where they would roast their coffee at one time. And, um, <laughs> once Pete's, <laughs> once Pete's bought out Stumptown, they stopped roasting their coffee down in the basement. And so there was this huge amount of square foot that was just not being used. And, um, so I had asked him because I didn't know if I was going to get into any markets because it was my first, I had had my business started for two months and I didn't know if anybody was going to let me in. And so, um, knowing Laura and she is an established artist. She's been doing it for like 10 years now. Um, I asked her if she would do a pop-up with me and that's kind of the history of that. It was really great because it was small. Um, we had a very limited amount of vendors and we all got to talk and drink coffee together. It was just like this cute, cozy atmosphere it just felt a lot different than any of the markets that we had been to. How did the two of you meet? So we have a mutual, really close friend. Tawny's best friend since forever was one of my best friends growing up. So we'd met and crossed paths quite a few times over the years, but really our friendship has grown from being connected mm-hmm. right when I guess Tawny started her business and reached out and that season, actually, right before we started this one in Stumptown, I was getting ready to do a round of the holiday pop-ups and markets. And I was like, hey, do you want to share a booth with me? These things are crazy. They're expensive to do as an artist in a small business. And I would love to share a booth with you. I don't want to do it alone. And let's just see. So we actually did a few other markets together that holiday season. And then this random one at Stumptown that Tony threw together. And after reflecting over that season of all these markets that we'd done, we were like, you know, that one we did in the basement of the coffee shop was the most fun. It was the the cheapest, honestly, because we didn't have to pay huge entrance fees (laughs) and just felt the most relaxing. And it just felt like a vibe that we really loved and enjoyed and, and not one that was being offered anywhere else. So... I kind of thought like, Hey, do you think they'd let us use that basement once a month? 
like never hurts to ask, right? They're not doing anything else in there. That so. was crazy too, because it felt like it would be such a stretch. Like I, I remember you, us having the conversation, you bringing it up. And I was just like, no way. They're not going to let us do that. Like, also, can you imagine how much work this would be? And Laura's like, we can do it. We can totally do it. Let's just ask. Let's just see what they say. And I, I was did like, put a in. presentation right. together. <laughs> she did. Yeah, she did. But uh, Nate, uh, Nate just brought it up to his supervisor and they were like, yeah, I mean, we're not using the space. Might as well. And so then it was just, then it was work time. <laughs> yeah. And the baristas <laughs> loved it because people were coming in that day and drinking coffee and all the vendors were drinking coffee. And, um, so it was kind of great on all ends and it was great for us because they let us store the pieces because the other thing about these big shows and being, um, an artist, we both do work that, I mean, Tony does ceramics, it's breakable. You have to load it in, set it up. I do with these big woodwork pieces. So you're loading in, fixtures and walls and stuff like that. So, um, to have a place where we could regularly be popping up and not sort of starting from scratch every time was really amazing for us as well. So, well, yeah. And you know, Stumptown wasn't using the basement. It, yeah. That's, that's, that's really cool, but all good things come to an end. COVID <laughs> hit. Yeah. Yeah. COVID we'll hit. Just, just, We'll just, just destroy your story. No, but, <laughs> but before, okay. You, you've talked about the vibe and, and, and Tony, I like the fact that you had just started and you thought, well, I, you didn't know if you're going to get in. And I'm thinking, wow, what better way to ensure that you're getting in is to run the event. <laughs> you know, it's like, I'm in. <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah. That part was nice. Uh, the scary part was trying to actually find vendors to fill it because also I didn't really know anybody. Like just starting out, you're like, okay, here we go. Cool. So how did that go? How did, how many vendors did you guys have at the first, the first event? Do you specifically question. down to the, no, I'm just kidding. About how many vendors? Do you remember Laura? The very first one, I, I don't know, but I think the probably around 15. Okay. At the moment. And how was it received? Because once again, it's a new event, so nobody knows about it. It's in the yeah. basement. But, you know. Yep. Okay. And then, <laughs> it, it, well, I mean, you know, it's, it is what it is. And then, so, you, and Tony, you're relatively unknown. So how, how was it received by the public? Well, a lot of friends came out, which was awesome. That's, which was hey. awesome. And um, yeah, it was definitely not everyone's most lucrative event, but everyone had a great time and everyone... Okay said that was really fun we should do it again it was kind of like um everyone enjoyed the community like we've been saying the vibe so much mm -hmm. and some of these things can be while they might be lucrative they are exhausting and um of your time and energy and everything so it was something mm -hmm. that as small businesses and solo preneurs if you will we were all craving coming together right and like it didn't matter that it wasn't that busy. It was just such a great, a great thing to do that, you know, we, ha we definitely had a few people in those first ones that never came back again because they weren't busy enough for them. But okay. a lot of people stuck around, stuck it out with us and grew with us really. What do you think, what can you attribute to, how did you guys create this vibe? Because you've, you've mentioned that multiple times now. <laughs> so was it the coolest basement in Seattle? No, or, it wasn't. Uh, no. We, okay. we spent no. a lot of time cleaning it up to get it um, presentable. So what, what do you think it was though that, that it was gave it this energy? Well, first of all, I think the size of the event, the fact that it was only 15 to 18 at the most vendors, that alone gave it just an intimate feeling. And we also were really careful to curate those 15 to 18 vendors so that there was never any direct competition. So one thing that tends to happen at okay. those really big markets is you might be next to like, you might be selling candles and next to 10 other candle people, or you might be selling, you know, whatever it is. And so it's not really natural to go bond and become friends with all the other vendors when you're just 
immediately like in direct competition. Like it's just, it's sort of a weird thing. So that was something that was really important to us to make sure that like all the vendors that were there in this basement could all fully wholeheartedly support each other and not feel just even an inkling of competition. So we really made sure to, when we were choosing the lineup to have it be that, and it did contribute to everyone supporting each other, everyone wanting to walk over and shop from the other vendor, shouting each other out, encouraging people to shop their fellow vendors. Right. So that was part of it. I think another part, That's awesome. um, I think another part is the event aspect that we add to the market in the mornings And sometimes even afterwards, um, we do, we've had live music before we've had yoga or Pilates, we've had wreath making classes. We've had, um, we did another recording of a podcast that Laura did with our friend, Carla Marie, who runs, um, or she used to run. Yeah. Um, stop. What was the show? You both talked over it. Sorry, Carla Marie and Anthony show. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, anyway, so I, I feel like that aspect of the market makes it feel it has, it creates a vibe in itself. It's not just like, we're only, we're here to shop and we only have a certain amount of time, get in, get out. Um, we, and the coffee. Oh yeah. I mean, the coffee helps, uh, of course, but everything's better with coffee. Yeah. But I mean, the coffee did facilitate people sitting down with each other and having real conversations. Yeah. I do think that was something oh. that was different. No, that's that's very cool. I think that's. I mean, if I were to go to a you know some large event and it's good coffee because it, you know it's one thing to yeah we have a, an urn of coffee that's been sitting there for six hours and it you know it, it's not pretty good, but Stumptown is pretty darn good. I agree. Yeah. <laughs> So, so you did the first one and then you started doing these once a month. Yep. Yes. So from a logistic standpoint, that's gotta be easy. I mean, you did kind of allude to, you were a little overwhelmed to start with, but in all seriousness, how hard is it to put on an event once a month? Once you, once you started this, is it easier than, okay, you're, you're all laughing. This is fun. They're all <laughs> laughing at you folks. Um, can you hear them now? They're laughing. Um <laughs> What, I don't what know could go why wrong? We I mean, it's it. artists, it's creatives. <laughs> Nothing can go wrong. Nothing goes wrong with creative people. <laughs> I think we were definitely over uh, confident, overzealous. I don't know, enthusiastic about being able to pull it off because it was it was never easy. It was. I mean, we were kind of working with different people every month. And, um, it was a lot to coordinate, but we did have our systems down. You know, we kind of knew like when we get there, what we do, we divide and conquer. We always have people help, but it was always just like a, "Ah!" (laughs) and then make it work. And then it, it just sort of came together and we learned something every time, but. Were you both still showing at these events too, or did they take over to the point where you couldn't run a booth. No, we were both still showing. And, um, in fact, us selling our work, there was the only way these were at, like, yeah. <laughs> um, Able to happen. somewhat affordable yeah. for us because we weren't really making money off of them. We were just, just no. wanted to have a spot and commune with other vendors and provide this space. But, um, even though it had become its own like entity and a whole other side hustle to our side hustle, it wasn't uh-huh. something that was, uh, we weren't really charging people much basically as long and the short of it. We were just, well, doing it. Short of it. it was $86 for two days. It, oh. it, that's pretty, that's pretty inexpensive yeah. in the grand scheme of markets <laughs> with only so- 15 people. <laughs> So pricing is always interesting when people price things. So why on earth did you price it at 86 bucks? You could have done it 75 or a hundred. Why 86? I'll leave that to you, Laura. (laughs) Well, it was actually 85 was the exact. And again, I don't, I think it was like, we wanted, we were more dedicated to making it super affordable for vendors because and under a hundred dollars, because again, as a small business owner, every little expense counts and, Um, you know, I'd been doing it for 10 years, but I still was scraping and scrapping things together every month. So 
it was just trying to make it as cheap as possible for the other vendors, but just kind of covering our costs. And Stumptown uh-huh. was letting us use the space. So we didn't have tons of costs, but we also did not cover the time we were putting in at all. No, Such we won't, is, we won't yeah. talk. Yeah, we won't talk about your time because yeah, it's gone. <laughs> so how long did you guys did you move to another venue? Out so you, you did up, up until the big pandemic, you guys were doing the Stumptown basement. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then when COVID hit, then Stumptown actually decided to close that space completely. So that space um, is no longer super sad. Um, yeah. We d- we had no idea that last February was going to be our last market ever there. Um, yeah. It was pretty sad. Yeah. We canceled you know, the first market when COVID hit thinking we'll reschedule for July. It won't last long. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, maybe two months. Yeah. And then I think by the second month we realized, well, okay, maybe we should figure out something else to do. And then like Tani said, the location closed, we had to go pick everything up and um, we didn't, you know, tell anyone cause it was just so, you know, it was the beginning of COVID. There was a lot going on and we were just like, what? It, that's so sad. But so yeah, everything changed and we thought we were going to just be done with the market for good. But we had in that time grown an online presence. So we did have a platform. And so, and we had planned and booked out vendors. We, we already had vendors booked out for like the next five months. So we had... okay already promised these vendors a platform and a space. We had already made plans to do it. So it was either sort of at that moment, it was like, do we email all these people and refund everyone and just say it's done and be yet another thing that's being canceled in your life? Or do we figure out a way to pivot? And so we pivoted. You're using that dreaded word. Yep. But we is the most overused (laughs) word. I use it all the time. I'm teasing you, but I I hate that word. I just like but but how else do you describe it? I mean, what else, you know, I mean, it's the most applicable word to what everybody has been doing. You know, pandemonium and chaos is another way of describing it, but pivots neat. Yeah. So how did you transit I'll say transition? How did you transition into the online platform? How did I mean Walk us through that. What What's that like for you guys? Is it easier than you don't have to set stuff up like that? I mean, so you're not lugging your stuff in. I guess that's good, right? Yeah. Well, it, I think one of the be- one of the biggest benefits to having a virtual market versus an in person is one shipping. <laughs> and <laughs> well, no, sorry that that's one of the harder things. That's, I guess I was yeah, say, that's what to I was me. thinking. Shipping is hard. But one of the biggest benefits is that our, we're able to sell to not only local people, like we're selling stuff all, all across the U S um, which, which feels really cool being a small business. That's that usually only sells to people in Seattle at markets. And now you're reaching farther selling more, hopefully. Um, So we feel like we've, a, a lot of the people are, happier with the virtuals than the in-person even. Well, Tony, let me ask you a very specific question. You're selling your stuff virtually, right? Correct. Where's the most interesting place to you that you've sent something now? Uh, Has somebody bought from you and you're like, oh, wow, they're in. There was a, well, there was one in Kansas recently, which I was like, oh, wow. I've never, never been to Kansas. There you go. Um, and then there was one in Florida, but yeah, those are probably the, but see, that's really good. You, they probably would not have come to, to the Stumptown basement. No, I don't (laughs) think, I don't think that they would have known. Honestly, people, people walking by Stumptown didn't even know that it was in the basement half the time. It was hilarious. People were just like, wait, where can you tell us where it is? We have the sandwich board out. We have balloons where we have somebody outside telling people to come in and they're like, Oh wait, this is happening. Where (laughs) you you gotta gotta, like make it super obvious sometimes. And Laura, how about you? Where's the most interesting place you've, you've shipped something now. 
Um, yeah, I think all over the, the East coast feels okay. like, you know, especially everything I do is very Northwest inspired. So it feels really right. special when I'm sending something that's like, you know, something in Mount Rainier to like, Lake Winnipesaukee or something, you know, like Lake <laughs> New Hampshire. Um, okay. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. That's what I was thinking of. There was one once was like the address was like an Island in the middle of Lake Winnipesaukee. Was it? Oh, wow. Okay. That's kind of, kind of interesting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But to also to your question that the, these being how we've, sort of transitioned them. Um, pivoted, pivoted is your word. <laughs> it's definitely like less physical work on the weekend of for sure, but it's, it has changed into much more work on a logistics admin marketing standpoint. So with the physical markets, we would sort of post some things on Instagram, try and tell people it was happening. Um, but it was more relying on the actual physical market and there was a lot of schlepping and work involved, but then, you know, we sort of cleaned up Sunday night and washed our hands of it. And we're like, all right, we'll see you next month. And there wasn't a ton of work in between. And now it's a daily, like a daily job. And we have someone else helping us with social media because it's now that it's fully run on social media, it's much more about making sure that we're, supporting every single one of our vendors every single month that we're doing all the extra things. Um, you know, we use live chats, we're uploading IGTVs, we're doing a live virtual event. We're making sure we're posting every single vendor and their products multiple times throughout the month and making sure we're really like promoting them and sending people their way. So it's just different now. So what platform so how are you, how are you doing these, the virtual events? Instagram. Cause I'm on your website, right? Insta- you're selling stuff on Instagram. Yeah, so walk so- me through. Okay. So I'll just tell you the quick story. Okay. Our Instagram account. I'm not allowed to go there. I'm not allowed to touch it. And, and, and to quote, okay, boomer, stay away. <laughs> that would be, so I, I'm not allowed. And I honor that. Mackenzie's listening. She'll love that. Um, <laughs> I'm not, so I, Instagram is not foreign to me, but I, it's not my native tongue. So okay. how are you selling things virtually on Instagram? Well, so first How's of all, we should, we should mention we, as the film and market don't sell anything. We are still okay. the same way we were as when we were in person. We're not, we weren't taking a cut or selling any of the vendors goods ourselves we're just facilitating and creating a space or now an online platform for these small businesses and vendors to sell themselves. So I would say the best way to describe it is that our Instagram, the Fullman Market Feed, acts as the hub and um, sort of the place where we showcase all these different vendors and send people directly to them. So people purchase them directly through those vendors and their Instagram, whether it's through their Instagram stories or they're directing people to their website. Um, but so it all, it's, it's all just digital marketing when all is said and done, but just in, in real time organic and actually instead of clicking on a website, you're sort of directly messaging the vendor. So it's that kind of back and forth. So your next event is the is at the time of this recording, your next event will be, be gone. It will already. Yeah. So how does this work on the day of? Are all the vendors supposed to be by their phones and you know like like I'm on I'm on your website right now and I clicked on Henry, which Tony, that's you, right? So right. if I if I liked something and I wanted to purchase something from you. Yeah. So if you, if you wanted to purchase something from me, um, and it was during the market, you'd be going to, uh, Instagram actually. And Mm -hmm. then you would not allowed to go there. Oh, (laughs) (laughs) then you would have your daughter go to Instagram for you, have her go (laughs) to the market page and she could look at all the feed from like the past month and see, Oh, I like, I like that bag. And then when you click on that, it'll tag the owner of that company. And then you can go to their Instagram and you can look in their stories. You can look in their posts. 
figure out okay. what they're selling. And then on the day of the market, you would plan out who you want to shop from. Hopefully it's more than one person. And sure. you would go to their stories and they'll tell you whether they're having a, a story sale where you literally see something that you like in their stories and you type in sold and then follow up with them after that, or they'll direct you to their website and you can shop directly from them. But we essentially are the ones who are helping get their word out as to what they're selling for that, that weekend. Well, that day. So am I oversimplifying it by saying that you're kind of their social media, you're, you're like a social media aggregator that you're bringing all of these creatives together and yeah, we're collectively we're their high we're their they're high, high people. people. The high. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I mean the with the virtual markets, it definitely is basically we're giving them a month of hype, a month of promotion, a month of okay. like putting them in front of this pretty big organic audience that we've grown, um, that are really supportive of small businesses and want to shop them. And we're just, um, constantly showcasing their work to the audience. And do you just, just Instagram or do you, do you promote this on any others like so if Facebook or if you're on, dare I say TikTok? No, <laughs> we need we to start do doing TikTok. Socials. We got to do, we got to start doing TikTok. We got to start doing the no. dances. <laughs> Come on, Laura. No, well, no, let me, let me, let me just pause because I hang on a second. I um, recorded an, an interview earlier today, which will come out after this one. So teaser for an upcoming episode. There's a guy out of Kent that does cocktail cards. He, he, he sells a, a box of cocktail cards to show you how to make oh, various cool. cocktails and they have a QR code on them. So you use your phone and then there's a video of how to make the cocktail. Oh, wow. That's kind of cool. Oh, yeah. right? That is cool. He's not as old as me. He's probably a little older than you. Not much, probably. And he's on TikTok and the, he does little 57 second minute videos of him making a cocktail, kind of like, you know, and it's going crazy. People are, people are loving it. So I don't know that you should discount yeah. TikTok, Laura. I know. We, we had a guy on before. He's, he's a woodworker out of uh, Washougal down south. And he's blind and he goes by the blind woodsman. Wow. So there's a blind guy making wooden bowls with a lathe and, you know, hand power tools. He's got over absolutely over a half a million followers. And I think it's over a million followers on TikTok. Wow. wow. And so and he sells, he and his wife, his wife is an artist as well. And it's working for them. It, people are, intrigued by that i i don't know i think maybe you guys, it'll be seriously the, I, maybe it'll be the new yeah. instagram i don't know I, I don't, yeah. i'm kind of tongue-in-cheek with you know like t teasing you but i on certain things but i'm i'm completely serious here that i think you should look at it yeah well I, we do, really do definitely on our own businesses we we try to make videos and stuff i've done quite a few reels but the idea of just okay. getting on whole different platforms sounds very intimidating but but we do what I, I, but we love the idea. Noted. We're going to work on it. No, okay. That's um, all I can I explain. was going to say, um, we do, though you said you were on our website and before you clicked on Henry, we do always have like a market lineup on our website. And mm -hmm. that's where we put all these vendors and link to all of their websites directly. So that is the other way that we promote and that's we send awesome. out emails and stuff too. But where all the action happens is on Instagram. We use and Facebook also, but. It's a little, it's yeah. essentially the same content. So yeah. Right. At some point in the future, we'll all be able to gather and be, you know, more than six people in a thousand square foot room, I think. Well, so that's and happening maybe, now. And, well, and, and maybe we'll want to. So, I mean, some of us are still not sure we want to ever leave our caves. Do you guys think you'll do in-person events again? I mean, is that, or do you, well, let me rephrase that. If you start doing in person, would you continue to do the virtual also? So, yeah, we have our very first in person in over a year coming up uh, next. When this podcast comes out, it'll be the next thing happening May 2nd. And um, we are still doing the virtual. So we have a May 15th virtual and a June 26th virtual. And then we'll keep doing those every month because that's very much now what we do and we feel like now that we have that reach and it's working well for people we don't want to take that away 
but we're certainly doing this in person. It's totally different. It's not in a basement. People will be <laughs> really far apart. It's not going to be that cozy um, back-to-back feeling, of course, because it, we have a lot of COVID protocols we're being really careful about. But it is something where we get to all put our pieces, like set up a booth, come together in real life. And we're pretty excited about it. It's a big, beautiful space with lots of natural light. So again, totally different than the basement uh, in Pioneer Square. <laughs> yeah. So, so where, where is this going to be? So it's in, uh, it's called the 101 event space in Pioneer Square. It's right across from General Porpoise Coffee. We have to make sure we're always next to good coffee. Uh, um, <laughs> yeah. So it's in a great, big, beautiful space right in the heart of Pioneer Square. And all the vendors will be like at least six feet apart. We'll be monitoring how many people come in the space. All that. Everybody has to wear a mask and. Yeah, of course. Mask fill out a form. Yeah. So how is it, how has this been received by the, the, the artists? Did you have a real, has, is there a, are they all dying to get back out again? I mean. Yeah, that's a good question. How's that been? So, I, words are hard sometimes for me. <laughs> well, I think, that probably won't get cut out. Um. I think we have um, just very, like, there are definitely some people who really feel like the in-person is really what works for them and their business and their product. And those people have been dying for an opportunity like this to get back in person again. And then we certainly have a whole other school of vendors who really prefer the the virtual format and have no interest in doing the in-person thing again. So we're finding that it's, it's very much split and that a lot of people aren't necessarily both. They are one or the other. So we're, we're happy we get to serve like both. We have opportunities for both right now, which is exciting. And I think we will try to do in person a few times a year, but we're not, we won't probably ever go back to monthly in person. Monthly, maybe yeah. quarterlies. Yeah. Maybe Unless yeah. sometimes reopens and that basement is available. Again, available. But, yeah. yeah. I don't know about that. What, what vendors, why don't you, why don't we talk a little bit about who the vendors are for the May event? Oh, yeah. Yeah, go ahead and give us a, you know, I, I'm not going to ask you to name every, if you guys can name every vendor, great, but I don't, I don't want to put you on the spot for that. I can. But what sort of, okay, Tawny's up. I'm on it. Okay, here we go. We have Amanda Whitworth from Sawdust and Soul. It's a woodworking company. Um, Lana Bear from Peace Love Bear. She does vintage clothes. Shay from Shady Designs. She does jewelry. Uh, Sincerely, Sarah Jane makes candles. Crystal Wellness Co. Um, the owner is Yasmin, and she does crystals and uh, candles. Uh, we have Art by Stasia, and her name is Anastasia, and she does... Um, what would you call that, Laura? It's... Resin art. Yes, resin art. Painting and resin. Mm-hmm. We have um, Kimber from Kimber Elements. She makes jewelry. Uh, we have London Fog, and they make candles and cocktail smokers. Uh, Art by Avery is a, a clay artist that makes jewelry. Um, we have Hello Chloe Marie. She does embroidery. Sea Salt Sweets. Um, they make cookies. Um, designed by discovery, Sylvia, she does candles and dyed homeware good or homeware goods. Um, uh, Masoda glass, which you just interviewed. Um, she does glass blowing, um, Vina copper canoe woman. She makes jewelry as well. Uh, live long and plant. They, uh, sell different kinds of plant kits. Um, sorry, I lost my place. You want me to take over? Yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> we uh, particle goods. So she does incense and candles. Salt Creek silver. It's another jewelry metalsmith. The mint gardener. She's a watercolor artist and teacher um, who has books as well. Splendor and stone jewelry. 
modern science project. She makes objects, art objects and jewelry as well, and planters, things like that. Rain ceramics, so ceramics. Um, Bloom Away Seattle, that's dried florals. Lose East Soul, um, that's encaustic painting, I believe. Um, Puddles Barkery, so that is for the pups and the dogs out there. She makes really fun dog treats. Saffron Ceramics, it's another ceramics. We have Creo Jewelry, who does jewelry. Um, and then we have Thatch Floral, who'll be there with fresh florals. And then we've got Tani, who'll have ceramics. And you have me, and I'll have my woodwork and my prints of my paintings. And then we also have a photographer there, and we are all collaborating on a big, awesome backdrop. And she'll be doing mini photo sessions at the market as well. That's a good lineup. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, know if, I don't know if you want to do the lineup. whole rundown, but it's lengthy. It <laughs> it's lengthy. Yeah. No, that's that's great. Lots of Mother's Day gifts. It's the week right yes. before Mother's Day. So it's kind of a one stop shop for like local handmade, all the things. We're pretty excited. And how did you end up at this location? What's the start? Because it's a cool from the photo on your website, it's a cool looking space. Yeah, that's a funny story too, actually. (laughs) Uh, So our photographer and also social media girl and also just dear friend um, had booked this space for actually for a photo shoot sort of or wedding type event that totally fell through. So she had it booked May 2nd and just kind of was like, Hey, I have this space. And I actually had done two events there in the past. I've done with like my backdrop and my, um, I did a mural there for a Facebook event and I did a backdrop there for a wedding event. So I knew the space and I was like, Oh, that's the perfect space. If we were going to have a market, it's the perfect space. And that is the perfect date. If we were going to have a market the week before mother's day, that's the perfect date. So it kind of just came together and, we just went with it and simultaneously we moved into phase three. So that helped too. I'm noticing a trend with you guys. It just kind of all naturally falls together for you. Kind of. The basement makes itself available. (laughs) Tawny, you, you looking for a place. There you go. You, you shows and all that. So that's awesome. And so it's going to, that's going to run from 11 to three. Correct. Yep. Okay. Uh, what, what else does the public need to know about that? Anything else? Well, I'd plan ahead because I think there might be a Mariners game that day. Um, well, but they can only have 8,000 people at the stadium. <laughs> that's that's a sellout right oh, now. Oh, that's a good point. I forgot about that part. Yeah. Yeah. Because right, okay. you know, it's the disappointment. I could make a bad joke that there wouldn't be more than that there anyway, but they're doing really okay. well at the time of this reporting. They're in first place. So okay, more people well, would go. It's thank you though. It's a little encouraging because we were a little bit stressed about that because, but parking, just thinking about parking, it's definitely a thing. And then, like we said, masks will be required. We'll be limiting the number of people in the space. It won't be super limited because again, it's a huge space. So we are mm-hmm. allowing for extra space in between everyone, but um, there may be a, a line. We're not sure, but, um, what else you'll have to sign a waiver at the door. And obviously if you're sick at all, don't even come. But okay. other than that, come ready to shop because we have so many good things. Uh, right. you can RSVP also. I mean, all the bags if will probably be by sold yeah. by the time this recording goes what, out. What do you, what are the bags? The bags. We have RSVP totes um, that we're giving to people. Well, you purchase an RSVP ticket online for $10. You can find it on our website. And it comes with a tote that has our logo on it. We'll have coupons from all, well, some, some of the vendors that want to participate. We'll also have raffle tickets for, for someone to win a set of cups from me, a print from Laura. Yeah. And some card packs, uh, possibly. Um, yeah. 
but yeah, it's like a goodie bag for shopping that day. And just to help us kind of know, get a head count and have some people that are guaranteed. And if there is a line, those RSVP, the people who have RSVP will skip the line and head right inside. Right. Oh, so you're going to have like a velvet rope. Yeah. So we like, might, you know, yeah. Do. We'll probably have something like that. We'll There's probably also going to like be a metallic balloon. <laughs> there okay. you go. Uh, I forgot to mention, <laughs> there's also going to have in each of the bags, there's going to be a hand dyed face mask. So if you forgot your mask and you're one of the Very RSVP cool. folks, you can yes. wear your new mask. Yes. Very cool. Normally should have asked this probably at the beginning of the episode, but how did you come up with the name full moon market? That was, oh. uh, yeah, I guess that was me. I just thought we need to have some fun branding and it's monthly. So that automatically made me think of like monthly, like the moon phases. And we did initially do it on on or as close to the full moon as possible. So that was the whole idea around that. Um, Nowadays, it's not exactly on the moon, but we're, we're sort of like witchy people. So we like, we like, you know, full moon rituals and burning our candles and incense and reading tarot cards and stuff. So. All right, cool. So let's talk about the two of you then let's, let's transition abruptly away from full moon market and let's talk about the two of you and your art. How did, we'll start with Tani. Tani, how'd you get started? And oh, don't make that. She's making a weird face, everybody. I'm going to put her on the spot. Tani, seriously. Okay. <laughs> how'd you get started in art? Uh, and how did you end up where you are now? Um, let's see. Well, I went to school at um, the Fashion Institute of Design and Merchandising in LA. And I feel like that was kind of the start to everything. Um, I ended up moving back to Seattle because LA made me feel a little bit claustrophobic. Um, and so I can't, it, there's just people everywhere. You can't get out, you can't get out of the city ever. And so yeah. that just made me feel like I got to get out. Um, and then I, was working at a boutique. I was managing it because one day I had always hoped to own my own shop. So it was kind of like my trial into it. Um, but then I got pregnant and then I had three kids. And so all of those things kind of drifted away. Um, Life happened. Exactly. Yeah. So then one Mother's Day or birthday or something, my husband got me... Um, a gift card for pottery classes. And I hadn't done pottery since I was in high school. So it was something that (laughs) was something that I always loved doing, but it was like, okay, I'm trying this again for the first time. Um, and I fell in love with it. And so that's kind of the history of that. And I had originally started Henry as, um, kind of a catch all for all the things that I was interested in artistically. So I would do art prints and I sold vintage and I did pottery. And after a year or two of doing that and running the market, I was like, okay, what (laughs) you got your hands in too many things. (laughs) I was also previously before I started Henry, I was doing photography also. So it was just like too much on my plate. I needed to narrow it down. And, um, essentially I just decided that pottery was what I wanted to do. And so now that's my main focus, uh, that and full moon market. So that's, that's kind of my background. (laughs) How did you come up with the name Henry? Um, Henry was actually one of the names of, of, it was one of the contenders for one of the kid names. And, um, I always think of, I've always wanted to think of my business as being like one of my babies. Like it's always something that I want to honor and take care of. And I don't know. So yeah, that's cool. Thanks. That's a great story. Thanks. Laura, what was, how'd you get started in art and how did, you know, what to where you are now? Um, so I, also went to, I went to school for art. Um, so basically I think I spent a few months at the beginning of freshman year of college trying to do much more practical degrees, but basically 
just kept coming back to art and was kind of just like, whatever, I'll, I'll never make a living. I'll just work way more than possible because this is what I want to do. I'll find a way to make it work. And that's kind of been my MO ever since. I also got a degree in interior design um, and did both for a while and have worked just the gamut of art and design jobs and um, had a career for about five years doing display and design for a really large retailer. And in that job learned sort of every single medium of art and every single tool possible and really honed my own aesthetic. And then um, I came out of it and worked for another large retailer doing again, windows, displays, design, all that. And it was the same scenario where they were sort of these like dream jobs artistically. And it was very creatively fulfilled in a lot of ways, but I was always doing my own artwork on the side. So I'd have shows, do my own stuff, paintings, that kind of thing would work on the side. And I just kind of, even though I love these jobs, I really dreamed of doing my own work and having the creative freedom, being my own creative director. So I side hustled it for a really long time. So I'd do like the the design and artwork all day for these companies. And then I would come home and do my own work all night and all weekend and double timed it for a very long time. And then finally made the leap, um, I guess a year before we started the market or so. So I'd been doing it for a long time, but finally doing it completely on my own was of course... A whole different thing. And yeah, so here I am now. I've built a big studio in my backyard and um, it's what I do full time, though. I, I also now have a baby. Well, she's a toddler now, but so I split my time, of course, with her, but like was on the saw building woodwork up until she honestly was born and she was two weeks late. So, <laughs> um, wow. Okay. Yeah. And here I am. So I, I also am kind of like, all over the place. I do a lot of different mediums, always with the same, you know, aesthetic inspired by the Northwest. But the things I do the most are woodwork and painting. Those are kind of my main focuses, but I still don't really just pick one thing and go with it. I still have a, do a little bit of illustration, a little bit of design, a little bit of this, but my bread and butter is the woodwork and the painting. So did you both grow up in the Seattle area or did you move to the area? Yeah, yeah, we're both from awesome. around here. You go ahead, Tony. I'm from Port Angeles, Washington, and Laura was oh, born okay. and raised in Seattle. Well, Lake Forest Park. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Lake Forest Park. Okay. And so when you're not out creating art or running shows or herding cats or children. Or dogs. And other than Stumptown Coffee, Give us some places to go and things to do in the greater Seattle area that you guys find fun. Because yeah. we always like to ask people that are like, you're not working 24 seven. Now you double timed it, Laura. I get that. But you know, even you are taking a break once in a while to do something, something yeah. fun in the area. Right. Yeah. I mean, okay. I'm a big outdoor person. So again, I don't take as much time to do those things as I would like, but when given the chance, I love to go on a hike. Uh, my favorite hikes in the general area are Lake Serene. That's my kind of number one. It hits all my, it checks all my boxes for a hike, which is really good mountain views an Alpine Lake. That's a good destination to hike to sit down, enjoy the view, have a snack. And then it also has a really awesome waterfall on the way, way up, which is my husband's favorite thing to hike to. Okay. And Tawny, how about you? Do you go back to Port Angeles? I do. Yeah. I go to Port Angeles. Well, I try and go once a month, but lately it's been a little, okay. not as much. Um, well, this counts as Washington, but it's not super local, but our family, okay. it's Washington. our family's favorite spot is Mazama, Washington. We go camping over there each summer and we love it because we, um, we have a really great campground that's um, on a river so the kids can play in the river. And then during the day we can bike in for coffee and then we bike back. And then usually we bike back in for tacos in the evening. It's just like, I don't know, paradise for, for me. Oh, I, 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 love, I it. love it there. Yeah. I love it there. Um, Twisp is also, I really like I've Twisp. heard great things about it. I haven't actually been, but yeah, I've heard it's great. 
that whole, uh, that whole area is just check out the so pretty and yeah, no, it yeah. is. <laughs> no. So how'd you guys get started going there? Just out of curiosity. Uh, again, my friend Tess, she's, <laughs> she's a good inspiration for me. Uh, she uh-huh. has been going there for years with her husband. They like to uh, forage wild sage out there. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. So we went with them and I was just like, oh, all right, yeah, we'll go camping, whatever. Um, but then lo and behold, now it's a place where we literally go multiple times a year because it's our favorite. So awesome. yeah, all right. it's great. So I'm teasing you about Stumptown, but are you a coffee fan? Yes. Tony? Yes. Okay. Tell me where, tell me a place in the Seattle area I should go for a, a good cup of coffee that I might not know about. Ah, I actually have one, but I am blanking on the name right now. So one second. Oh my gosh. She's looking at her phone, folks. She's I got this in her phone. figuring it out. <laughs> it's in Fremont. Okay. Let's see. <laughs> I'm going to find it. Hey, Laura, how about you? Do you got one? Are you a coffee drinker? Yeah, I'm a huge coffee drinker. Though I don't know if I have any like secret ones for you, but I think my oh, favorite, don't have to be secret. my favorite coffee is Herkimer Coffee in Seattle. Okay. And so yep. my favorite spot is Revolutions, but they serve Herkimer Coffee. Mm. Okay. Yeah, that that Tommy? place is pretty good. Um, my favorite spot is Milstead. Have you ever been? I have not. Oh, it's it's great. Um, and my husband is the most picky person when it comes to coffee and how it's weighed before it gets Uh put into the espresso maker. And if it's Uh single origin versus, you know, whatever, all of that stuff. Like he is one of those kinds of, one of those kinds of people who can taste the difference from cup to cup and tell you about how it finishes in the back of your mouth or, you know, whatever. Um, Uh but he approves and loves it as well. So I would highly recommend. All right. And I always like to ask people, so another one, you eat, you know, when you're not doing art and all this, you got to eat. So where's, and I always pick lunch because lunch seems like a nice, not overwhelming, like, you know, it's just lunch, um, lunch spots. Okay. I have a good one. Okay. We don't go out to eat very much at all, even before COVID. But if we ever right. do, we would go to like a brunch at the Fat Hen. Have you been there? Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. my that's good. our favorite. Okay. How about you, Tony? Well, us also, we don't get to go out to eat very much because kids. Three kids. Um, Three kids. Yeah. <laughs> She's gonna say Chuck E. Cheese. I just know it. <laughs> <laughs> I actually have never been to Chuck E. Cheese. Oh, you're my hero. Thank you. <laughs> um, but I if I were to go out, I would choose the Corson building. It's one of my faves. It's in Georgetown. Um, my dear friend owns it and is the chef. Um it's amazing. Check it out. What type of food? What type um, of food? Local. Like everything okay. is local and she, um, she's just an incredible chef, uh, uses, uses all the local ingredients. Um, yeah, they actually like throughout COVID we, everybody was afraid, you know, for all of the different restaurants and local businesses and they, uh, started doing takeout orders and, they sold out every single night, like weeks in advance. Um, so super proud of them and all the work they're, they've That's been great. doing. Yeah. Not to make light of COVID cause I'm not, but it's interesting when we talk to people because this is kind of what I do now three days a week. I talk to people doing things in Washington and it's been devastating. Let's be honest. I mean, it's been devastating to a lot of businesses, but the creativity that people are, I mean, you guys, went from a physical space to a virtual space. Right. And now you're going to maybe do a hybrid of doing a little of both. You might not have done that had yeah. COVID not happened. Right. Yeah. And, and now you're selling stuff to the middle of an Island in New Hampshire and you're sending stuff to Kansas. I mean, that's kind of cool when you think about it, you're you've expanded outside of just the Seattle area. Yeah. It's really interesting to see how restaurants and other businesses are, 
adapting and coming up with creative ways and how people are supporting businesses differently than we did you know, two years ago. Yeah. So let's wrap this up so that you guys can go be creative. <laughs> so Where can, two, so, okay. There you go. So two, two questions for each of you or well, actually one, first off, one of you tell us where they can find out about full moon market, all, all the places like that. And we'll put links in the show notes, but then both of you, where can people find you and your individual artwork? Okay. Well, you can find the full moon market on Instagram at full moon market dot Seattle. It's the number one place for all the things, but also full moon market, Seattle.com. Great okay. way to find us. And then you can find me. Hey, Tony, where can, oh, oh, sorry. Okay. Laura, go. No, Laura, go. You can find sorry. me at Laura Burkhart on all the things or Laura Burkhart creative.com. Okay. And Tony. Um, I am shop Co. Um, that's my website. And that coincidentally is also my Instagram handle. Wow. Yeah. What question didn't I ask for the last thing? What, what question didn't I ask that I should have asked? Did we forget something? What did I overlook? Hmm. Anything? Um, well, this not to open up a can of worms, but one thing we didn't talk about is how we choose the vendors or how vendors become a Let's part go. of the Fulman market. Let's and, talk about that. Um, it's worth mentioning because one thing that I do think really sets us apart or two things about that is that we don't really care if a business is super established already or if they have any kind of following. Like, again, we want it to be like open arms and a supportive community, but we do want them to have like a brand and an established website. But if they just started, but they have that all together and they're within our aesthetic, they're in. But we've helped a lot of vendors like launch their business by this being like the first thing that they really do. So I think that's something we're both really proud of that we don't, you know, try to seek out people that already have a big following. We're happy to help people that are just starting their business. And then, okay, that's great. Yeah. Well, let me ask you then the follow-up question to that is if somebody's listening and they think they might like to be part of one of your shows, same places to find you. What's the process for somebody to apply to be a vendor? Do you want to talk to them? <laughs> yeah. Um, so if you want to vend with us, you can get on our website and you can click on, I forgot what it actually was. Hang on one second. But do you remember what it is? Apply. <laughs> Probably. Apply. So we have, yeah, an application on there. We have a tiered experience, different kind of plans. And yeah, we really just, we go through them every few months and, or more often than that, but um, it's a lot to catch up on. And we really are, we have a very supportive community and we, the two of us that kind of brought this together, the Fulman Market has an aesthetic that's the two of our aesthetics sort of melded. And we do try to keep things within that aesthetic, mostly because the community that's following along and shopping, like we know what they like and we don't want to bring on a vendor if we don't feel like they're going to sell well. We want them to have a really successful market. So we don't feel comfortable taking someone's money and telling them you're in this market if we don't think anyone's going to purchase their goods. So that's right. the main reason why we like to really curate it. Right. So if okay. you are interested in being a vendor, fill out a form submission, pay the vendor fee, and we will be getting back to you as soon as we can. That doesn't mean that we'll be getting back to you in the next couple of days necessarily, but it will mean that we will be getting back to you within the next couple of weeks or months. Yeah. We do our best, but both of us also have families and other jobs and stuff. So we try and get together once a week, but not always are we able to go over all of the application fees or application. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We'll put a link to that too. Cause you're right. It's the apply button on your side. Sorry. Yeah. Sure I should have had that up in front of me. <laughs> you should have the coffee shop up in front of you. No, too. I can't believe it. <laughs> I know. Yeah. Sorry. Well, thank you both for making this happen. We had a, you know, an emergency on my side and we screwed up that schedule and I appreciate you being Very flexible coming you. back to this. Thank you, Scott. You. We appreciate thank you. you so much. We feel really honored to even just have the conversation and that you're interested in chatting awesome. with us. So thank you. Yeah. 
Yeah, this has been a lot of fun and I wish you guys all the best and I'm excited. I, I know I'm not going to come over for the Mother's Day show because I have to come over the following week. So two weeks in a row and Seattle doesn't work for Scott. But um, <laughs> Another time. Uh, maybe in may, the tell your friends. Tell your Seattle friends. Yeah. Well, well, we have a lot of those, so we will do that. All right. You guys have a great night. Thank you. Bye. Join us next time for another episode of the Exploring Washington State podcast.